Hi, Miles. I didn't realize you were here. <laughs> Hi. Miles is always here, the ever present, the ever vigilant. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I will ask, uh, I will have Robert um, get you three copies. That would be wonderful because then I can really, I know two people who have got large audiences who love Gabrielle's work and it's time to get something like this out. It's such a unique book. It's so I'm beautiful. Sure. Thank you. I'm sure and it'll... Wonderful work you did. Mm. And so much, it's so her. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so unique and edgy and personal and funny and just everything she is was is in it it's a marvelous meeting of her huge soul i loved it oh thank you andrew and and, and it came out physically beautiful as well i thought with the photos oh, it's, a, it's it, as pure it's in her line too that line of hers yeah so um can you tell me when you first met how you met and what that was like Oh, I'd love to. I met her at the end of my 40s when I was invited by Quest, I think, to do a Sufi anthology, which I called Perfume of the Desert. And I put in all of my wildest favorite Sufi quotes and tried to sketch the whole path of divine love as seen in and understood in the Sufi tradition. And I plucked up my courage and I sent it to Gabrielle because I'd already met her work and been overwhelmed by it and how wonderful it was and i'd love to get to know her so i sent her the book and she gave the most amazing blurb for it and invited me whenever i was in new york to go to dinner with her so i found myself in new york about three weeks later and i rang her and she said okay meet me at x so i met her at x she came in totally in black of course black 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 and we sat down and both of us had two glasses of wine, I think, because she probably was a little nervous. I was a little nervous. And then she just opened in the most remarkable, amazing way, like Gabrielle could. She said, darling, you're a wild one. This is an incredible anthology. You have passion. It's a very difficult gift. You mustn't ever, ever repress it you've got to express it don't let them shame you humiliate you put you down because what you're bringing is something unique so never let anyone tamp your fire and then she proceeded to tell me a lot about her own journey in elliptical you know how gabrielle talked she never talked directly she swooped around things and we had this astounding meeting of hearts and souls and bodies and at the end of it we were forever friends because she had just blessed me from her depth and i felt totally received and understood by her and knew that i had in her an ally of sacred passion then that, that was actually a common experience of people meeting her for the first time that oh, it was God. it was like the phrase I used in my introduction was soul at first sight. It's soul at first sight. And she had this amazing gift of, um, of not being intrusive with it. So she wasn't sitting there being Gabrielle Roth telling you who you are, like some of the other great teachers might be tempted to do. She was just meeting you as a complete naked human being, seeing you, but also showing herself so that you felt enveloped by true love an incredible spiritual gift and the gift that permeates all of her work and a dangerous gift because you have to rise to it you have i think relating to gabrielle wasn't difficult for me it was the easiest thing in the world because she was like a long cool glass of water after years in the desert <laughs> so I was so thrilled that someone as edgy and amazing and non-conformist and totally unconventional as her existed because I felt I was in that liminal area all alone. And then she appeared with all of her amazing work and said, go for it. So it was a blessing. And I'm sure she did that. I could see from the book that she did that to so many people of so many kinds. And that was what she was like as a teacher, wasn't it? So you, so you were in your late 40s, you said? Yes. And now you're what? 
oh, I'm 94. I'm going to be 70 in June. So this is a long time later. Uh, we're the same age. I'll be 70 in August. It's a great age. We sh we're just getting going. We should just, it's a great, but it's because partly of having met her, I think what happened up to that was that she invited me to teach with her. That's what I was wondering. It was right away you went, started teaching? Yeah. We went about a, oh, five or six months later. I turned up. Had you, and, and you had done her actual work with other teachers or something? No, I, I read the book and I oh, practiced okay. it in my own crazy way because I wasn't going to turn up and be ignorant and just think, you know, Andrew Harvey's here and he'll dance with Gabrielle Roth, you know. Of course, I listened and read and practiced and in my own way, but nothing prepared me to be in her presence. And Jonathan was there at his most luminous and amazing. And Jonathan enveloped me with love and Gabrielle enveloped me with love. And we had the most incredible experience because she allowed me to talk out after each movement and introduce Rumi and mystical perception and mystical transmission into the mix. And it was electrifying what happened because she and I were so in sync and she would encourage me to go further. So she said, go on, give it, give it, give it. Don't hide, don't pretend, don't mask, just go on. They can take it. And everybody was in such an open state that the poems I read and what I was saying really melted into the extraordinary intensity of the rhythms. And it was one of the greatest teaching experiences I've ever had. And we did it, I think, a couple of times after that, but it was a momentous revelation, really, of what dance and mysticism come together could be. And then, you know, as she was dying, I just finished a book called a Heart Yoga with a great yogini, Karuna Erickson, in which we'd melted together the classical asanas with stages of mystical illumination. And this had had a huge opening. Gabrielle had blurbed it. The great yoga teachers had blurbed it and said that it was preparing the next level of yoga, of using yoga in the holiest sense as a crucible for transfiguration, consciously opening to divine mystical light practices and mystical poetry while in yoga poses. And this had a tremendous impact, on, has had a tremendous impact on the yoga community. Deepak blessed it. All the great yoga teachers came out for it. And I sent it to Gabriel and I said, what if we did this for the five rhythms? If you want to do it, I'm ready. I I couldn't imagine anything more thrilling than working with someone I love so much and admire so much. Gabrielle rang me back immediately. She said, come on, we've got to do it because I'm not well and I might be right. going, so you better right. turn up soon. So again, I found myself in New York with her and we had five or six unbelievably beautiful holy meetings in which we went a long way towards doing what she knew was necessary for the five rhythms movement. She'd come to a place where she knew that the work that she'd already done was absolutely wonderful. She had no false humility about the amazing work that she'd birthed. She knew that it had created a gentle but powerful revolution in sacred dance. She knew that she'd given a really holy, powerful modality to humanity. But she also knew that it had limitations because it wasn't explicitly linked to real mystical transformation. And Gabrielle was a true blue, wild, holy, absolutely unconventional mystic. Absolutely. As I came to know in our conversations, because she kept saying, you know, it's not about the body. It's right. about the body being the feather on the wind of the spirit. It's about vanishing through the body into transcendence and coming back into the body with that knowledge of transcendence so that you know the body for the first time. And I was, I didn't know that she knew, knew that or was that was at the core of her being, but it was electrifying because well, one, one of her, fa one of her famous uh, quotes that showed up time and again would be you didn't really think this was about dancing did you <laughs> <laughs> well she knew that it was about the real dancing the dancing right. 
with the whole of the experience, like Shiva's dance, the dance of being able through dance to contain the dance, to be open to the dance, the horror and the glory, the dark and the light, the pain and the joy, all together as one huge experience. And she so how, herself, how are you going to, how did you plan or how did you start to weave it with together with Rumi's teachings about the mystical stages? Well, first of all, I, of course, sat with my experience of what had happened in that first time we taught together and how, although it was improvised, it had been stunningly powerful, the marriage of mystical transmission and the tremendous opening of the dance. And then I looked at the five rhythms and really meditated on them. And I found the appropriate Rumi poems for each of the rhythms and related the five rhythms to Rumi's own extraordinary transformation. And I presented those poems to Gabrielle and she was very thrilled. But that was just the beginning because then Gabrielle you know, Gabrielle was beyond a master. She was not a guru. She was not a master. She was some kind of unknowable, unnameable <laughs> phenomenon. Who the only name for that phenomenon is Gabrielle Roth, right? <laughs> we'll never see her like again. She was everything in one amazing, loving, humble, but absolutely dedicated and ruthless woman. It's amazing combination. She had it all. And she was also edgy and street and everything. So she didn't allow for any kind of projection. But when she got something, as I gave her, I didn't turn up to work with Gabrielle Roth, you know, just thinking I can wing this, I prepared. She took it and she took it into herself. She breathed it in like a tremendous new holy drug. And she allowed herself to go into semi-trance with it because Gabrielle had a tremendous gift I noticed with her of negotiating between the worlds all the worlds were present in her at the same time and she was of course very focused and very human but she was also able through her enormous discipline of absolutely abandoning herself to something completely new and I knew enough to let her just abandon and speak from the place that she was in, like a kind of New York dressed in black. Were, so, you, re were you recording it or writing it down? It was all recorded. Yes, our, our sessions are all recorded. We have the whole journey that we were able to take, which of course was never completed because she died. But we have everything that is momentous. And one of the dreams I have is that the five rhythms movement will allow me and allow the person who recorded it, Nilaya, to present it to them very humbly and say, here is what Gabrielle was working on. Here is what we were working on. We would love to experiment with this with you because Gabriel believed very passionately and says so that this was the next step for this great movement that she created. Well, she's been gone 10 years. It might be time to uh, make that happen. I think it's essential that it happens because it's really important now in the middle of this apocalyptic situation, because one of the things that Gabrielle and I talked about all the time because Gabriel was abs one of the few spiritual teachers who knew exactly how ghastly things are. Gabrielle was not hiding from anything. She was not at all a doom merchant. I mean, she was always for hope, but she loved the dark. She knew the dark had great secrets. Why would she call herself Ravenwood? And you know that wonderful poem about, I love the dark in all the ways that I love it, the dark valve, et cetera. Gabriel was a creature born out of the deepest pain and suffering and confrontation with the dark and absolutely aware that we were in an apocalyptic situation. But she was also aware that this was a perfect situation for a revolution in human consciousness. There wasn't just a mental revolution or a spiritual revolution, but also a physical revolution. 
And all the work that I'm doing now is about the birth of a new humanity out of the global dark night. And this is the moment of the birth. So it's the moment for this form that we worked on as she was dying, she was giving birth, typical Gabrielle, using her exhaustion, using her anguish, using her debility, not to be sorry for herself. She never talked about the dying process with me. I knew she was dying. She knew she was dying. But she, at the first meeting, said, we're not going to talk about it, not because I'm in denial about it, but because I have this amount of energy and I want to give it to this. Cool. I said, OK, let's yeah. do it that way. Let's do it your way. So that's the way we did it. So even dying, she was giving birth to the next stage of what she knew would be the most powerful, imaginable tool for birthing all of the people who'd come all that way with her in five rhythms into the next level of divine embodiment, conscious divine embodiment through the interpenetration of the five rhythms with Rumi's poetry and the Sufi vision of transformation, which is the great vision of transformation it's all the systems all the traditions this is a fabulous opportunity and i'd love to be able to do it and i i mentioned it to jonathan and jonathan was very kind and very open but nothing came of it i think he perhaps wasn't ready for it at the time because he of course has his own tremendous responsibilities but maybe now he would be and i hope that he is because it would be a tremendous pity if this great last transmission by one of our greatest teachers of strange embodiment, as I call it, would be lost. It would be a huge tragedy to the spiritual world because Five Rhythms has had a massive global impact. Imagine if it could be taken into that next realm. And does it, it need to be delivered? Together. Does it need to be delivered in person as opposed to simply completing the book? possibly with someone else well i have a gabrielle's assistant nilaya was the one who recorded it yeah and she took it in at a very deep level she absolutely was thirsty for it and she herself has has done the compilation and we've talked about her and i producing the notes with a kind of introduction from both of us and we've talked about her and i teaching it but i think it would be a wonderful thing to do for the whole movement and it would be up to robert and jonathan as to how it would come in but it must come in now the book is out so let's have the last transmission out it's fragmentary but i know enough to be able to fill it out from my own experience with her and from my own meditation on that experience for many many years for me becoming cellular in my body. So I could certainly be there to be a kind of ragged, helpful, humble midwife of it. So it started, you, you backtracking a little, you started to say you, you came in with some poems for each rhythm. Yes. Do you remember, well, any, do you remember any of them in your head? Oh God, I can't remember them in my head at this moment, but I mean, they are all the poems, the greatest poems for each kind of the rhythms. And I've got them all and they, they would all be in the book. But what happened was actually so momentous, as I tried to explain in the introduction. She took it all of that in, all the poems that I'd given her, and all the kind of vision of the whole path that she'd experienced through my Rumi teachings, through our teaching together. And then she went into a very deep, deep meditation on birthing Jonathan. She'd had a very long birth, very difficult birth, but then she'd been possessed by the power of the divine mother, the great primordial power. And then Jonathan had come through her. And she told me that because she told me that that was where five rhythms were conceived. So I had to go back to the poems I'd selected because I was still in what was essentially a potentially male paradigm because Rumi, after all, for all his openness to the divine feminine, was a guy, right? And he'd gone through a very, not a masculine path because it's a comprehensive path, but listening with every cell of my being to Gabriel's account of 
the five rhythms being born out of a majestic, terrible, amazing experience of actually giving birth and experiencing at the deepest level the transformative power of these rhythms made me then select a wholly different kind of Rumi and kind of way of presenting the poems because I come in with my inevitably masculine perspective, but I'd been anointed and initiated by her feminine knowledge, which is, of course, the deepest imaginable kind of knowledge, as I'm a devotee of the mother. So I, I humbled up and I said, oh, God, we've got to arrange it all. And she said, of course, but this is the way, isn't it? We have to take it all in and rumble it around and then refuel it, remake it. And we did. It was amazing. I was not going in with any prescription. I wanted to be initiated by her because I loved her. And I not only loved her, I knew she was a very great teacher and that I was very honored to be asked by her to do this. I wasn't coming in thinking I'm Andrew Harvey and Gabrielle Ross should listen to me. I was coming in as her student because I was her student and I remain her student. And how, 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 can, how do you envision, if, if you were to take that next step and, and give it to the community, how, what would that look like? Well, I think one way it would look, and, you know, I'd love to have your input because you know the community and you know how powerful and wonderful this modality is. But one way it might look like is having a group of, say, 30 people, the kind of the laboratory radiant golden guinea pigs assembled some, somewhere in New York after the book has come out so that everybody's had a time to absorb it and us just going for broke as a kind of way of beginning to use this. Because I think what's essential, and this is something I know is very, very important to Gabrielle because she explained it to me. She said three things to me. She said, first of all, I'm truly thrilled by how global Five Rhythms has become. But it's not enough because Gabrielle was always trying to push the envelope. She was never satisfied. She was joyful, but never satisfied because she was she had a molten dream that drove her in her soul. I mean, that was Gabrielle. That's why she was who she was. The second thing she said to me, is she said, I have really tried to get the linear understanding of five rhythms out and and teach people through my own example how to teach it but i've always wanted people to run themselves uniquely with the teaching because it has to be transmitted by each teacher having integrated it in their own unique way otherwise it's just another guru trip and she wasn't on a guru trip she was making a, she was like a great cook who want to cook the most amazing food and want everybody to eat it and then make it their own and transmit it in their own way. And I think all of the five rhythm teachers that I've met have been very much their own person, ignited by Gabrielle, but teaching it in their own way. So I would want whatever we did to be an invitation to people to dive in and make it their own in their own way, not some kind of definitive guru like this is how it should be done. These are the poems that you should read. <laughs> and if you don't do it this way, your karmic consequences will be that your womb will shrivel and your genitals will turn to ash. Not at all like that. It should be a free offering from my wild spirit and whoever wants to work with me to the whole movement so that they can integrate it. And the third thing is that Gabrielle was very worried, not in an uh, anguished way, but in the kind of way that Gabrielle was worried. Gabrielle married a great detachment to a great focus. She wasn't, she wasn't at all hysterical. She was so, and that was why, what made her so penetrating. So she was worried that people were taking and using five rhythms to feel great, to feel good, to feel empowered, which was wonderful, which is her whole aim. But they didn't completely realize that all that energy was being given to them through five rhythms so they could stand up in a tragic, terrifying time and actually use the five rhythms to fuel sacred activism. She loved my sacred activism. She was a thousand percent behind it. And she wanted that five rhythms to be taken to the next level of birthing power so that people could be born 
through the five rhythms to be humbly empowered enough to stand up and say a huge no to all these structures of cold evil and a huge yes to the building and creating of a new world. So she was very, very emphatic on that. I think all teachers in this dreadful bazaar that is the new age get worried that their edgy teachings eventually become assimilated in ways that undercut the real subversive truth of what they're trying to communicate. I've had that because I've given, written all the books I've written and again and again I hear people formulating what I've tried to give in ways that are so bourgeois and so settled and so unexciting and so unthrilling that I want to jump out of the window and think, my God, have I given all of this blood for people to think that sacred activism, for example, is like going into your garden and digging for new plants. I mean, it's not that. It's about rising to meet the challenge of the apocalypse. And I think Gabrielle felt some of that at the end of her life. I think she felt that the edginess, the rapturous subversiveness, the dynamism of what she'd actually given in Five Rhythms had been in some ways tamed by its great success. And, and nothing made her cringe more than when people would just assume that it, assume and, and lump it in with ecstatic dance. God. You know, put on music and do what you want. It was so not what she was about. And she would go nuts when when people just made that assumption that it was all the same stuff. Well, if you go back to the experience that I had of sitting in Robert and Gabrielle's place, Gabrielle in black against white, lying down in the long chair and go, taking me through the birth of her beloved son and how that birthed this very precise model of how you birth yourself through free but precise kind of movement, then you can see just how maddened she would be that people thought or could think in any way that it was just permission to jump around in various different ways. It was nothing to do with that. She was bringing in a subversive modality of the divine feminine and of the dark feminine too, the light and the dark feminine. So it was very gutsy and in your face and subversive and radical and revolutionary. And to be just thrown into the great rag bag of ecstatic dance was a tremendous humiliation for someone who's a radical pioneer like that. Yeah. Am I, am I overstepping the mark by saying that? No, know? that's what I just suggested. And, and, and her work, in addition to the movement, she also had a whole, uh, as, I, as I'm sure you read and saw, a whole map of the human psyche, a medicine Absolutely. wheel that covered the emotions and the life cycles and all and of A very that. integrated map, a map that allowed it really shows the integration of spirit and matter and psyche light and dark everything together in birthing a new kind of human being free from the religious and political constraints of the past that was her mission well i would be very excited if you created a little lab laboratory in new york for 30 people for a weekend or however long you need it well, I, I, you know, Robert and Jonathan will see this and they'll see my sincerity and my love for everything that they're doing. And I would love to be in conversation with both of them because the time has come. We're in the most dangerous evolutionary moment of our whole history. And the modality that Gabriel and I were working on was is a very potent modality for empowering people to rise up in this global dark night and become born into their divine humanity f as free agents of love in action. So let's get with it. And there, it's a global movement. They're all waiting for it. They've all been primed for it. Here it is. I've got a huge army of sacred activists who'd love to learn Gabrielle's work in this new modality. Love it anyway, but love it in this new modality especially. So there's never been a bigger audience potentially for what she wanted to give us. So let's go for it. Andrew, when, when do you experience any fear when you 
because I noticed my belly kind of tighten when you when you come back to words like this apocalyptic dark time and, and no, you, you don't no, you get I don't, no, because, no I've been in this for 20 years I've I've gone through the horror and the terror I've died myself so no I see this as an age of unspeakable opportunity which we have to grasp immediately because the collapse of everything is a tremendous opportunity to bring in the real modalities of healing and empowerment which couldn't come in before because people weren't ready for their intensity but now they are because they're desperate enough to reach for something totally real so i i am not um constricted by the apocalypse i'm in fact grateful that it's here and that i'm here and that real teachers are here so that we can truly help people in a much deeper way than they ever let us help than before, because before they were resisting everything we knew. This Gabrielle and I used to talk about this a lot. She said, I wish people would get how terrible it is because then they'd get how wonderful this modality is and how helpful it is. So you wake up in the morning um, more on the side of gratitude than dread. Oh, God, yes. I am supremely grateful to be one of the teachers selected to be at this time to help humanity. And I'm going to do everything I can in the crazy way that I do things <laughs> to give everything I've got. Why not? This is the time. The apocalypse is here. It is here. It's, the world is going, going to die out if it doesn't go through a major transformation. But the great good news is that we have the modalities for that transformation on the earth. We have the great mystical systems. We have great mystical pioneers on the earth. We have people who really have been through death and rebirth themselves, who are not gurus, who want to share everything they know. And we have modalities like the five rhythms, especially if they marry Rumi in this great process of transfiguration that Gabrielle and I were talking about because she knew about it from her own angle and I knew about it from mine. They have that available. So the great horror is the great opportunity and the meaning of the global dark night is potentially the birth of a new humanity, but we have to get the modalities available for that birthing out now. That's what I'm doing in everything I do. Oh, thank you for that. It's time. It's midwife time, you see. Yeah. I, I think when, when you ask me that question, I think of Gabrielle in labor herself, in the agony of labor, a long labor, but the ecstasy of being possessed by this primordial force of birthing, which is what has possessed me and many other teachers like me. And we know that a birth is possible, and we're dedicating all our energies to making people aware of the possibility of that birth through this great death. The divine never sends a terrible ordeal without sending the balm and the ungent and the opportunities and the healing powers. They're all here, but we have to see them and work with them right now because time is running out. We don't have time to fiddle around. And imagine what a tool for this birthing, five rhythms with this new modality added, through the work that Gabrielle and I did together would be like. It would be stupendous because it's already reached millions of people who really feel its effects. I mean, some people might be using it to jump around, but lots of people that I know are using it in very tender and serious ways and feel massively transformed by it when they do it because it is a transformatory system. Imagine if it was taken to that next level that Gabrielle longed for it to get to and that I was working on her for when it becomes consciously about bringing the light in and being transformed through the five rhythms into a different kind of divine human being who could then be strong enough not to feel dread at the apocalypse, but to feel, oh, my God, here is the time to give birth to myself, to give birth, help other people give birth and birth together do something amazing to use this collapse to bring in a wholly new way of being and doing everything i i think maybe the the first years of the five rhythms by necessity had to address psychology first right right i think it had to be done in the order she did it i yeah. think she did the perfect thing because she's so grounded 
So she, her feminine intelligence showed that people needed to get with the program, a precise program that would enable them to get all the psychic gunk. Right. She had to meet people where they were. Right. Not and them, they not realizing that there was, an, there was more to, more behind it. This. They, even as it is, it's able to take you to states where you could recognize that. Yeah. But I think Gabrielle's own experience, and this is something that I learned from my time with her, which was very intense and very deep and very beautiful, was that um, the key was knowing the transcendence so that you could know that the imminent, the body, was crystallized lighter energy, that you could know that you were the vast wind and your body was a feather on that wind. So she felt that the five rhythms could take people into those kinds of states, but they might not be able to identify those states and be able to learn as much as they needed to learn to get to the next level, which she had always been in as someone who wasn't was both not in her body and in her body in a way that was deeper and richer than anyone else so the paradox of her own intimate experience of the marriage of transcendence and eminence she felt hadn't sufficiently come through in the work and that was what we were both hoping that this marriage would help engender it certainly came through, at least in hints, every time she opened her mouth in a workshop. <laughs> you know. And it came through in the way she related to people, in the way that she could be very fierce just for a second or two, and then very loving. She gave very clear pointers towards it. But I think she came to feel that the modality that she'd created needed that tuning up to go to even more down it needed to be more consciously upped to go even deeper into the cells and the bones as it had with her yeah because i think from her own from the conversations we had gabrielle had had a tremendous opening at the beginning of her whole journey to that and this being one but i think her own experience had immeasurably expanded and deepened and become broader and wilder and if possible even more subversive because she was not one of those people who became more conservative as she grew older she became more radical more subversive naughtier if you like <laughs> and i think that she felt that there was this next level had to be made available because humanity was going to go through what she already knew was a potentially terminal crisis. But of course, if she was alive now, she would know that we were in that crisis, in the bloody mess of it all, needing this next modality. Yeah, well, she definitely the warnings came through. I mean, she referred to this as the time of chaos and teaching how, how to dance slow dance with chaos exactly what did you learn from her what did it what in your listening to what i'm saying how were you reacting to what i'm trying to say well i you know i err on the dread side still i'm afraid to confess oh i don't god no i understand don't don't be I, how why wouldn't one god yeah, yeah. um the truth is when when she died i had been around her for 34 years very close very close i mean in the early years i was in her original um theater group where we performed our own lives in a um ensemble uh, as well as a humorous way and a powerful way every every saturday night in soho <laughs> And um, and so we first met as collaborators in theater, and with me sort of as a, she saw me as a writer, um, and then the you know the dance and the movement and the five rhythms work kind of came with the package of who she was. So I went along for that ride. I and I even became one of her teachers. Wow. However, when she died, I had an epiphany, which was oh, 
I've been there for 34 years because of her and because of our relationship and because she was my friend and mentor and cheerleader and mystical inspiration. But I was not there 34 years because I, I particularly am a dancer and love to pr love the practice. That was my, you know, I didn't say this publicly, <laughs> but as a, I haven't, so I haven't done, continued doing the five rhythms work since she's passed, even though I was doing it for 34 years because it was her. I was, I, it was, a, it was a trans, it was a, she was a, she was a reliable, um, source source for me as needed i mean i could call her and did call her from all parts of the world when i needed a little she was uh, your beloved in some sense she was a beloved of your soul yeah totally and it was and like you it was it started in the first meeting when i was yes. 28 or so wow how lucky you are god yeah what is the quality that you love most in her that really if you had to single out one quality about her what would it be well the spontaneity freedom creativity fueled by emptiness is how i would put it very much right I think that's a fantastic description yeah you felt that she could go anywhere with you yeah. And that she was not phased by anything you said. She'd come up from left field and say something even wilder than you'd come up with because she was not defending anything. She was not involved in her own. She was astonishingly egoless while being enormously present and sometimes wildly neurotic and all the rest of it. And yet it was so inspiriting being around her, even in her nuttiness, she was deeply adorable. Yeah, and you know, just being around her would automatically bring forth from me um, kind of a much fuller, wholer, higher level of my own being. She would bring that out of me because it was demanded. I mean, I couldn't be less than that around her, right? And if you were less than that, she'd get bored pretty quickly. <laughs> oh God, yes. You know, someone yes. Someone was in their head or in their self-conscious. She would say the self-conscious person is the most boring person in the room. You know, that's not <laughs> who you want to, you know, you're drawn to, your eye is drawn to someone who's, you know, not being self-conscious, but conscious of self. And so, uh, yeah, so it was always, a, you know, there's a, always a slight, even over 34 years, there's always a slight nervousness to get around her because I knew yes. all my um, ego stuff. There was no, you know, there, it wasn't that, it wasn't that welcome there. <laughs> but that nervousness is a holy nervousness, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. you should feel that for a real, a real master. Well, master is the wrong word, a real pioneer of the soul. Well, because I was nervous to talk to you. I told, I, I told you that in the email. Yeah, but look at it. We're having yeah. a great conversation. I'm, I'm really, I'm a good boy. <laughs> no, because we're not. Gabrielle couldn't give a fuck for the guru system. She wasn't there to be a guru. She hated being put on a pedestal. She, I love the way she actually taught, and I learned a lot from it. Because when I first talked with her, I noticed how she would roam around the room like. A, a very thin wolf. She said she was a raven, but she was also a wolf. And a cat. A, black wolf. a cat. Yeah, a cat. And she, and she would encourage, but sometimes she'd pounce and she'd say, snap out of it. Right. Or, and then the guy would laugh because they were in their heads or the girl would laugh. Right. And she, but she had such precision because she was, by her virtue of her own emptiness, everybody was in her. So she knew in a certain way what, what everybody's state was, she could tell. And she knew exactly the appropriate gesture or word to say. And people loved and trusted her enough that they knew that she wasn't being aggressive. She was simply saying, oh, don't waste the time being in your head when you could throw your head away and experience what happens then. Amazing, huh? Yeah. What a an amazing force but she still is that force 
I don't feel Gabriel is dead at all. I, one of the great gifts of holding that amazing book that you've done. Remind me of the title, because I'm going to send this out to all of my group, too. What was the Mind title? You what? Oh, well, the the title, yes. Dark Light of the Soul. Oh, my God. How could I forget that title? Dark Perfect. Light of the Soul. Perfect, right? <laughs> perfect title but perfect book the work you put into it to bring all these incredibly varied testimonies together along with her amazing quotes which contain the secret of life again and again and again in inimitable Gabrielle style and all done jumbled together but with great wisdom and progression it's a masterpiece wow. it's Gabrielle dancing again yeah I had, unfortunately, I had to cut 70 people out because I oh. overshot. I had some 230 stories, contributions. And as I started to put the book together, I realized, uh oh, I have a 700 page book on my hands that'll cost You're about a thousand dollars to print. So I were right because it's just the right length. And that's what Gabrielle would have wanted because she was nothing if not economical, wasn't she? Yeah. yeah. In the way she did everything. One of the amazing things about partnering with her and listening to her is how how she spoke in rugged, graded poetry. When she was inspired, as she was so often when she was teaching. He was a beat poet in action, right? Total. It was all sublime, rugged, raven poetry and not a word wasted. Absolutely to the core of things, all the time let me tell you how i met her i was uh, i was editor of a new age magazine in the uh late late 70s just in the tri-state area um called the new sun oh. not, the, not the sun the new sun the um, new sun well it wasn't there is this you know the sun magazine oh, it wasn't that yeah it wasn't that um and so I went to cover an event at the, at the East West East West Bookstore. It's not there anymore. Um, they had they had a, an auditorium next door where uh, they present. They had three women presenters, and you had to um, listen to each presenter and choose one to spend the next day with. It was it was first. It was Jean Houston. Oh my God. And, I, and these were all wonderful people, but the difference was Jean, you know, is a, is an amazing intellect and presented her work in that, at a podium in that fashion. And then the second person was Patricia Sun. Do you know that name? I do. She's wonderful too. Yeah. She was amazing too. Uh, and then they cleared the podium away <laughs> and out came this slinking, woman in, in black dancing on the stage and speaking at the same time. And it was, whoa, it was like right at me. Oh, and it was, it, I didn't have to think or choose. It was obvious where I wanted to be the next day. And <laughs> what did you feel at that moment? What did she communicate to you that the others hadn't? I mean, Jean is astounding and Patricia's magnificent, but something that Gabriella Gabrielle brought, what was it? Well, she, I mean, for one thing, she was demonstrating being so outside of linear boxes in her, in the way she presented, she was so free. Her body was free. Yes. Her words were free. So I guess she was communicating freedom, I guess I would say soul freedom. That's what I felt. My soul was touched. It, it reached that part. You know, I, I, we all have that inside us. And we express it to one degree or another at different times of uh, freedom of soul expression. That's what I got from her. What a beautiful free. She would be so thrilled that you said freedom of soul expression. Yeah. Because and it I came out more. And like I said, it came out more in her presence. She would insist on it. Oh, she it was. One day I, I had to leave my marriage and I'd arrived in New York. It had been a very desperate passage and I rang Gabrielle and told her and she said come over and she said let's laugh about what's going on in your life let's just laugh at the madness of what you've had to go through and we found ourselves laughing wildly this was over 
drinks and dinner. Yeah. Mama wasn't there. She said, let's just laugh. Let's practice wild laughter. And I cannot tell you what that did for me because it was a horrific situation. But I realized there was, she was just communicating to me, mother courage. Yeah. Look at it from a different way. It's a death, but you can get through it. Let the whole thing go. Then, had you had you I, been in had you been in her theater group at the time, you would have found yourself in front of three hundred strangers the next night, doing a theater piece about your ended relationship. She would have. I'm sure she would have forced me, and I would have loved <laughs> it because she only she would have been able to get it out of me. <laughs> then I had a birthday about two days later, and she said, "I am going to give you a birthday party, and you invite all your best friends," and. That was the day I heard the most terrifying news about my partner, and I'm not going to go into it, but it was a day in which the death was final, if you like. And I heard it just before I got into the um, taxi to go to Gabrielle, and I pictured Gabrielle in my mind, and I said, well, what would Gabrielle do? And I immediately got the message, let the whole thing go and feel the freedom that you now have from knowing the very worst. Hmm. And I did. Something happened in that taxi, which just lifted me out of this tragic morass I was in. And I turned up at the birthday party. I told Gabrielle what was happening. She said, we're going to have the best party you'll ever have in your life. And we had the best party I ever had in my life. And everybody was happy. That was her. She was a great transmuter of horror and tragedy because she'd done a lot of it herself. Yeah. yeah. I think I don't know the details of her intimate emotional life because she didn't talk like that. But I can tell from her presence that she'd been through many kinds of hell and agony, but that she'd never rested there. She'd always taken the depth of truth from it and transmuted it into this really powerful love power that radiated from her. You know that after 34 years, I didn't discover she had a brother until I did this book and he contributed. That's how little of her was attached to her past or her story. She, she never dwelled or, or shared much about her past or her story. She, that's not where no. she lived. She did not live in her story. Or she lived in some kind of future Dane to visit the present, it seemed to me. <laughs> does that, does that, fit? she lived in a, in a dream, in a grounded dream of what human beings could be because she knew that she'd been taken there herself. Yeah. And her whole life was about helping other people reach the same destination that she'd flowered so magically and amazingly in. And so ruthlessly and really in, because Gabrielle wasn't just, she wasn't a softy. She wasn't a, a somebody. She exuded great love, but she, as you say, she she put you on your toes because she was so real. You couldn't hide in any of your games or masks with Gabrielle, and I didn't want to. So it was an amazing experience to be with somebody, whom I really could just be my complete self with. And I think there were many, many. I know there were many, many people who felt that. Well, that we, she, we all did. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. And that's what really needs to return to the movement, I think. I'm sure that it's doing well, and I'm sure it's being expertly husbanded and all of that, but I think that it would be a great shame not to inject this next radiance. It would, it would, it would, it would Andrew. I would really love Especially to. Especially now the book's out. What do, you mean, what, what do you mean when, you, oh, this book? Yeah, your uh, but, book's out, and then you, my book could come out, you know, we could... Did you say Nelia has already transcribed it into written words? It's transcribed it, it's here. We're always trying to find time to work together, but with your book out and opening up a next level of interest, yeah. then there could be a way in which my book and Nelia's book, which Gabrielle's in my book, and whatever it is, could come out. As in the form that it is with an introduction yeah. that would help people. And then we could have a workshop and then we could get this out for people who needed it, who wanted it for the whole movement. That would be really yeah. wonderful. Well, let's hope that this, I'm going to, with your permission, send this to my whole group, this wonderful conversation, so they can buy your great book so that that can get everywhere and send it to everybody in yeah. five yeah. rhythms, you know. They yeah. know my yeah. work. They know Gabrielle and I were blood brothers and sisters they and we're not trying to 
edging on anybody else's territory. We're just offering something to everyone at this moment. Huh. Wonderful thought, huh? Yeah. I love your book, and I really want to recommend everybody listening to this that they get Dark Light of the Soul. And who published it? Give the name of the publisher so they can... Well, it's Robert. It's Raven Recording. Raven Recording, of course. Right. Yeah, and there's a you just there's a link. Um, if if we didn't send it to you, I'll, we will. You can, you know, there's a there's a like a one pa one page little promo thing that has a a Perfect. link right to Robert. You should get this book. It's a feast of spiritual wisdom as well as everything else. And everybody, there's so many people, millions of people know the five rhythms. And sweat your prayers remains one of my favorite books to read because it's such a gorgeous mystical poetic masterpiece she wrote like a wild dark angel didn't she um what was i gonna say what do you miss most let's end by what we miss most about gabrielle what do you miss most what small or vast detail do you miss most about her I, I don't know that I can answer that. I'm sorry. It's everything, huh? Yeah. It's the whole thing. I, I, when I think about her, I miss her hands. Huh. These extraordinary long, big hands that she had. Huh. And whenever she was reaching out with her hands to, and the way she held your hand, which was very light, but very strong, as if she was totally supporting your hand, but not claiming you. So the way she held your hand was the way she taught, the way she was, the way she transmitted herself. I loved her hands. They weren't beautiful, traditionally beautiful hands. They were hands of a, of a very powerful shaman that was, but yet very elegant in their own stark, strange way. Sometime tomorrow, if you would give me whatever stuff is coming down the pike for Andrew. Okay. I know 4040 is coming. I've got the dope on that. You still there, Andrew? Yes. I muted Miles. Uh, but I lost your big picture, let me see. Okay, there you are. Uh, I'm I back. To tell you a story. I, 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 I've written about this, but not in this book. I, I brought my best friend from childhood to a to see our show in Soho. He is someone who has never been any remotely uh, has never remotely been connected to anything new age, spiritual psychological <laughs> never been in therapy never done a workshop never never just not whole different world and a wonderful human being he's a composer a musician so he's got the artist in him but he came to the show and afterwards we all went out to dinner and i in kind of i don't know if i manipulated it but somehow I, he was sitting next to gabrielle oh. at the dinner table <laughs> and there were about 10 of us maybe eight i don't know and robert was down at the other end, not that far. And she engaged with my friend almost full time throughout the dinner, one on one. And afterwards, he, he said to me, she was looking at me and talking to me in a way that only lovers ever have. Oh. And her husband was right there. And I said, Oh, well, that's how she talks to everybody. <laughs> right? Oh. What an incredible story, because it's exactly how, that intimacy. Yeah, Ooh, she, went she right had away. from her own emptiness. Yeah. And I think Robert was such, is such, was such, is such an amazing human being, because Robert loved her so completely and loved her in a way that left her free, didn't try and possess her or tame her or anything, was totally his own wonderful person with her wonderful person. And they were so marvelous together. It was so wonderful to be in their presence because there was a beautiful, strong, brilliant man, absolutely in love with his wife and absolutely celebratory of who she was without any need to 
protect his ego because he knew just how deeply he was loved by her. Amazing. And able to freely give her away to the world. Right. Absolutely. Without any kind of, whenever I turned up, I, I always felt maybe, you know, it was strange me turning up when she was dying to be with her. But Robert made me feel so welcome, so loved that he knew that it was important for her yeah. and he knew it was important for me. And I felt totally loved and celebrated and that our work was blessed and he would vanish. He wouldn't be there hovering. He would let us be us together because he trusted her totally and he knew that what she wanted was what she needed. Yeah. Amazing. Their marriage is the unsung song underneath her flowering. Don't you think? Yes. It's a it's a heroic example of what a man can be for a woman, for a strong, amazing woman. And she did the same for him because he flowered in his own way. She totally celebrated what he did. Well, he went from being a uh, hot, a hotshot lawyer. They right. they made a, a made for TV movie about one of his cases, actually wow. called Act of Love, because yeah, there there was a uh, <laughs> there was a man in in a who was paralyzed from the neck down in a hospital who begged his brother, might have been twin brother or just brother, begged him to kill him. Good God. And for whatever, this part doesn't compute, but the brother complied with his, but the way he chose to do it is he entered the hospital with a sawed off shotgun and shot oh, his brother. Oh and Robert got him off. Wow. And it was in the book, there was a book called Act of Love, and then they made a TV movie out of it. Wow. But he went from that world to Gabrielle seeing the photographer he could be and the drummer he could be, and he became the the base in all the meaning of the word base uh, of, of all her music. It's, it's right? stunning. It's, and it's really stunning, isn't it? Yeah. Without losing himself. Yeah. Finding himself. That's finding himself with her and letting her find herself. So even that she left us as an example, the two of them leave us an example of what true collaboration between an enlightened man and an enlightened woman can be like. And they're both so cool. I mean, I, I adore Robert, his style is so calm and penetrating and low key, but very wise, just as the perfect match in that, weren't they? Did you happen to catch the video he put out on um, Facebook about a month ago? No. I'll see if I can track it down for you. He he well, narrates he so narrates it, it, but it's woven in with imagery of her and him explaining who she was and how she was. I would absolutely love that, and everybody I'm sending this to would love that. Okay. So please, have you got your book by your hand right now? No, but I. It would take 20 seconds. You want to wait a well, second? Go, go and get it. Absolutely. Everyone get this book. It's so wonderful. It will bring Gabrielle straight into the core of your life. Uh, oh, I love the photograph. Oh, dark light of the soul. Oh, oh, um, oh. Photo was taken by Julie Scarrett, so I can shout out to her. And could you open it? It's something you love in it, and then let's conclude our conversation with you reading something of hers that really means a lot to you. The so it's everything means she's such a great writer, but I'd love to have the last words be Gabrielle's. Well. Then I'll just read her afterward, because I chose that intentionally. <clears throat> like a prayer wheel, I spin in the winds of time. In the downbeat of the mother, in the dark heat of prayer, I soak in the mystery. I do this for you and me and everybody we know and those we do not know. It's my offering. Inside my cathedral of bones, my blood pulses, my skin tingles with sweat, pounding heart, 
swirling breath, and for a moment I remember, God is the dance. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank so, you. Wonderful to see you. Wonderful to be with you and wonderful to feel your great love for her. And thank you for putting me at my ease. Oh. <laughs> sort <wow>. of. <laughs> you were fabulous. So, <laughs> no, it was wonderful to be with you. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you, especially if we, if you or we or some. Oh, well, send this to your group. I've sent this to the five rhythms people. Let them listen. Yeah, this is for everyone. But I mean, this I'm talking about if, if if something comes to pass, we're the next yes, step. You know, yeah, of course. Yeah, in the fullness of time, when COVID has finally abandoned us, we'll do this. Yes. Thanks for giving me your time. Great. My to see honor. My any time for Gabrielle is is no time. It's Great. all for her. Love her. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to stop the recording.